Hello everybody, welcome to Legendary Accordions. My name is Terry Cavanaugh, I'll be your host tonight, and we're so happy you've tuned in with us. We've got a great show for you featuring a great man, Mr. Alex Meister. You know him, you love him, but in case you don't have all the facts, Alex comes from a multi-generational family of musicians, and he's helped establish a national presence in his career. Things like the Hormel pepperoni commercials, his recording of the soundtrack for the Polka King, the national uh, released motion picture starring Black Jack Black. And uh, he's performed on over 50 albums, a Grammy-nominated artist, highly sought after as a musical educator. This is exhausting. <laughs> With his energetic and unique flavor, he's made major inroads with putting polka and ethnic music back in the public eye. Thank you for that, Alex. And to top it off, he even has a beer named after him. Come on, give him a great big round of applause, Mr. Alex Meitzner. How you doing, Alex? Sorry for the eulogy. Um. <laughs> I'll save it. It is, it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I am so honored that you asked me to be part of this um, because quite frankly, I'm looking forward to watching these other interviews and learning because one of the great things about the accordion is that it's an instrument that crosses so many different musical genres and, and allows it to be, a, it allows to be approached in so many different ways to express music as an accompanying instrument, as a lead instrument or solo instrument. Um, in duet form with other accordions, you know, and there's so many different kinds of accordions, which, uh, which invite different approaches. And we always have to remember, at least for me, we always have to remember we're trying to communicate something with our music. And whether that's as a beginning student or as a seasoned professional, um, it is a, it's an instrument that allows us to express and receive so much. And it's a constant learning journey for all of us. Well put. Well put. I like that. I feel better about what I'm doing now. <laughs> well, you are doing a great service here. Um, from from Carl Finch, I mean, just to, to talk quick, quickly about some of the other artists. Um, Carl Finch, who's a self-avowed non-accordionist who plays the accord, who's most associated with the accordion for over 40 years. Um, his approach to the instrument is just so much, so radically different from somebody like Ted Lang who has grown up immersed in playing the instrument in bands where he's had to be the nucleus as the bass player in the band, much like you or I do with our groups, to Danny Jarabic, who has crossed so many different genres. And, you know, I, I just look at all of this stuff and go, it's just awesome that we all play the same instrument, you know, and, and it's this funky instrument that, you know, is made fun of by, by some portions of the populations. It's beloved by others and it's the center of a party for others. You know I mean? So, you know, trying to maintain the appropriate seriousness, the appropriate humor and the, um, the appropriate just plain joy is, is what I'm always trying to do as a musician, as an educator, and as a consumer of music. Very nice. Hey, um, we're going to do some more interview. You've got that squeeze box on right now. Why don't you play us a song? I'm going to play something that is a little atypical of what I'm cons of, of how I'm known as an accordionist. Because most of the time I'm known for playing fast, crazy, loud polkas and faster and louder and crazier. But one of the things is that on any musical instrument. You know, if you're doing a lot of, um, on the trumpet, if I play a lot of loud and high playing, I have to practice a lot of soft and low playing and to keep our musical instincts um, developing as well as to find different avenues of techniques. So this is a little song that I wrote um, now 13 years ago when my first child was born, Zoe. And it's a little um, French. Uh, my, my, my drummer, Klanik, says that it's the Franco-Italian waltz. You know, mm. it's got a little French and Italian kind of lilt to it. Um, and it's just called the Zoe Lynn Waltz. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
How nice for a little Zoe that she had a song written for her. Well, I, I, I tried to, and it's amazing. I, I wrote that literally a few weeks after she was born. And, you know, in the midst of her not sleeping, but also being absolutely adorable, you know, in that way that an infant is. And uh, I, I got to see a lot of her personality already developing then, that now as she is uh, getting older, you know, it's that whole thing of life. You know, and I mean, I, I think back to having met you when I was in sixth grade, you know, and, and seeing how the paths of all these people um, cross. And that is a huge part to the whole way that I approach music and life. And whether I'm teaching or playing, you know, it's, or, or, or listening, you know, I mean, it's just like, you start seeing people in different lights, you know, you see our strengths, you see our weaknesses, our insecurities. And, you know, it's an important thing that it doesn't matter how fancy your accordion is, or how trashed it is in some, some ways, or, or what time slot you have with your band at this, this thing, you know, I mean, there's just so many different ways that we have to connect and, and, and see each other. And that's, that's what I, I'm, I'm trying to do always. Nice. Well, that kind of segues into one of my main questions for you. I was just going to ask you, what do you find fulfilling about the business of music? Do you know, um, if we have to sit there and go, Oh, how many times we have to play this certain, I mean, like you can, I, I can point to it and say that my father used to come home from working as the strolling accordionist at Disney and say, I played Edelweiss seven times today. <laughs> and I don't care how beautiful the song it is when you have to play the same song over and over again, it's very easy to lose that love and joy. But for me, what allows me to keep that is that communication that comes from an audience and from the other musicians I work with, um, the variety of musicians I work with, whether it's in my bands and the changing personnel there, or when we go to a festival and get to meet the different musicians and see how they change it up. Um, but the audiences, it is just, I, it's a cliche, but in this time when we are being deprived of having that interaction, you know, um, I look forward to somebody 
to that request for the chicken dance, you know, as, as much as I might have played that song maybe 2,000 more times than I needed to for my artistic fulfillment, seeing the joy and the camaraderie of how a song can bring together people from different generations and different um, societal places, different cultures, you know, and that's, that's what I think, particularly the accordion is so awesome with because you see it in so many different cultures and in a baseline, it just brings that thing to it. Yeah, what a great mission you have. And I know what you think, it couldn't come at a better time. We can use that, those kind of results. Yeah, and you know, when you speak of the business of music, you know, uh, as, it, as it pertains to the accordion and that kind of stuff, you know, obviously when you look at this time, these are some very challenging times. I, I haven't played a gig, uh, a live gig in over two months. And it's more than likely going to be at least another two months until that happens. Um, and definitely quite a bit longer for the larger kind of things. Um, but at the same point, we are being allowed and encouraged and need to do more creative projects like this. And that is a very valuable part of the communication of music. Um, at this time, we don't have sports that are competing with people's um, entertainment, time, money, value, all that kind of stuff. Music retains a higher thing. So I encourage all of us to be out there making YouTube videos, sharing stuff. You know, I mean, like when I see the creative stuff um, that so many people are doing in music right now, it, it really is inspiring to me. Good. That's right. Got to find the gold, right? Make the most of it. Better believe it. Hey, tell us about the early years. What was that like? As a Ah. Uh, the early years, I started playing the accordion officially at the age of four. I started at the piano at age three and a half. The myth is you came out of the womb playing the accordion. <laughs> well, not quite that. It was more drums at that point, as evidenced by the coffee table at my mom's house that still has the marks on it from, from when I was beaten on the drum stuff and the old piano and that stuff. But... My mom wanted, my mom was actually my first teacher and she uh, was very bent on making sure that I was able to read music and that um, she started me at the piano, but I was itching for the accordion as fast as I could because I want to be cool like my dad, you know? <laughs> and so I got my 12 face accordion um, at four. Um, mom gave me my basic lessons and I would revolt against the Palmer Hughes method in so many ways because I wanted to play by ear. And um, so then I would go hide in the bathroom with the, once I outgrew the 12 bass, I got a child size Skandali 120 bass. I'd go into the bathroom because the acoustics were really good. Mm. And she would tell me I had to learn how to play a scale and I would try to prove her wrong by learning a song by ear. And then later found out that if I had just learned some scales and chords, that would have come a lot easier. But, you know, um, a little bit of um, uh, stubbornness has been part of my genes, you know. And I went about that whole accordion route. Um, my mom still would not, I really wanted to play a button accordion but she would not allow me to get a button accordion until it was proven that I could really read music. Um, when I was in the fourth grade, I took up the trumpet like my grandfather and played that in the school band and was also playing drums and all of that stuff. Then my dad got a job at Walt Disney World's Epcot Center um, upon somebody else leaving that place. Um, he, he, he went there and, um, and um, when he left, when he, left to go to Florida because he came down two months before the rest of the family did. Um, I got my first button accordion. And so I was teaching myself how to do that and going in and out and trying to get the different notes to work and that kind of bit. And, you know, once, once the family moved to Orlando, that's when things started getting a lot more serious for me, primarily with the trumpet, because that was an instrument that I could formally study 
And Disney had so many great musicians there. I, I started taking lessons with Marty Gross, as you know, but Bill Boyd and Mike Payton on both jazz and classical things and being able to go and hang with the guys in the mariachi and that kind of stuff opened up my ears to a lot of different kinds of music. And I really shied away from taking the accordion seriously because um, I couldn't go to college for the accordion. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were very limited options for that. I was influenced highly by two accordion lessons I had with Don Lipovac from Kansas City, a national accordion champion who gave me all the Hannon and Cherney etudes and all of that stuff and encouraged me in that way and then I would listen to Joey Miskillen playing in every musical genre known to mankind and be like, whoa, that's so awesome. Yeah. And, but I still was, the accordion was, was how I was making money playing gigs. I mean, like I put my later hosen on and um, I, I got upset in high school when they made me play a couple football games on Friday nights when I could have been making money playing Oktoberfests. But, uh, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, the trumpet was my vehicle, and I truly believe that that helped my accordion playing a lot because it made me focus on the single melody and a phrasing of the melody. And so it, it influenced my accordion playing, and my accordion playing influenced my trumpet playing because you have natural phrasing that must occur because of the limited amount of bellows you have with an accordion. And without thinking on it at those times, um, I was able to start doing the multi-instrumental thing. The accordion allowed me to understand the function of playing drums because you've got the kick drum on beat one, you've got the off beat on the snare and the hi-hat, you know, and then you're sitting there much like the bass and chord <laughs> action going on on your left hand. You know, I was understanding the construction of bass lines, again, because the accordion is built on a circle of fourths. And all of this stuff, as I progressed into my seasoned age of, of musicianship, everything basically I've de determined has centered back to the accordion. It's like the accordion is ground zero for me and has allowed me to understand whole music and different musical genres, even if I don't necessarily play them, you know, I greatly enjoyed listening and learning like different French tango and, and Richard Galliano and, and stuff like that. Um, I, I've done now two albums and, and a composition project with Guy Klusevic, who is one of the more avant-garde artists of the accordion. And at first I was like, oh my God, I feel like an imposter going in to work here as an accordionist. And then we had a lot of conversations as we were doing duo performances and recordings. And I'm like, wow, he studied this instrument legitimately. And I came about it maybe a little less legitimately, but it's all makes musical sense. Mm -hmm. And there's more than one road to get to the same place. Yes, it's true, true, true. What would you have to say to our audience out there? We've got a lot of people that might want to play the accordion. They might've started playing the accordion and want to uh, do more with it, maybe forming or get their skill level up a little bit, a little bit higher. Any thoughts for them? Well, you know, I mean, it's just like practice, 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 you know, um, you are what you eat is I think the most important thing. Um, if you want to be able to learn how to play accordion in an Oberkreiner band, then you need to listen to Oberkreiner music played well with good accordion players in that. If you want to learn how to play jazz, you need to listen to jazz. Now, I'm not saying that's the only music you should listen to, but you have to do that. And practicing is not just what you play and the exercises that go into, it's listening to music and understanding other people's performances of it and then listening to the other musicians playing around you. And that's probably the most important stuff, you know. Um, if you go around and do all of your playing only listening to yourself 
or listening to what you think you're playing, which is probably the worst thing. You know, I mean, as I sit there and play um, the Zoe Lynn Waltz, I'm having to recognize when I'm not playing an arpeggio as clean as I would like to play it. You know, I'm, I'm, I sit back and go, oh, Guy Klusevic, Joey Miskill, and Steve Meisner. Oh, they would have, oh, Judge Church. I can remember playing in Minnesota one time and splitting stage with Joey Miskill. And, and it's like, I felt like I had mittens on my hands. You know, I mean, because it's the intimidation level of having Joey on the other side of the stage is like, I couldn't buy a right note out of the instrument. but knowing that I was able to sell it to the audience with the emotion that I put into music. And, you know, when I jump around on a stage, it's because the music is moving me. And so I'm roundabout answering your question and people need to find what attracts them to music, what kind of music is important to them, you know, and there's a time and a place for technical perfection but don't forsake musicality for technical perfection. I would rather hear a phrase fully formed and a flub note than hear somebody just. You know, I mean, if you're going to play when you're practicing your hand in. Try to make it as musical as you can, you know, and that's, and just find always the best, knowing the best teacher that you're ever going to have is going to be yourself because you listen to yourself play more than anybody else. But find the person who can open up your inner dialogue the best, you know, that's going to help speak to you on how you can get technique under in control and how you can emote and how you can find your inner person because I believe music is whenever we're performing music it is just one part of a person's communication you know nice yeah I'm gonna look forward to hearing that again <laughs> how about another song okay well I'm gonna pick up the button accordion here right now okay and um so this is something that's good to move around because this is a diatonic button accordion. Um, a stylish at sea harmonica, an accordion that comes from Styria, traditionally in Austria. Um, a diatonic heligon being that it plays diatonically in four keys. G, C, F, and B flat, of which almost all the notes except for a pivot note in the second third and fourth row are different going in and out so you get this and on the left hand we have the heligon reeds heligon is the ancestral name of a tuba and um so versions of this instrument obviously are related in the irish music you have the one and two row boxes, the one row Cajun accordions, the Mexicans playing the Gabinellis and the Honers, and everybody has their different pyrotechnics that work for their style of music. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to take a little thing that's probably one of my, um, my main show pieces on the button accordion. And this is a little adaptation of Aaron Copeland's Hoedown from Rodeo. And as I like to say, the first time I encountered this piece of music, I was a junior in high school. And I did a two-week performance study with the London Symphony Orchestra. I was one of two trumpet players picked in the Southeast to play in a brass quintet and spent two weeks at Stetson University in DeLand um, being coached by the London Symphony Brass Section and going to concerts and watching Michael Tilson Thomas conduct the LSO. And it... I mean, amazing stuff. And John Georgiadis was the senior, was like the emeritus conductor um, and did a concert as a member of the London Symphony Orchestra. It was, it was pretty awesome. I mean, you don't, if we, depending on what your musical preferences are um, or your prejudices, you know, 
you get a you get one feeling of what a symphony is if you have just seen pictures and videos you get another sense of what a symphony orchestra can do when you sit in an audience and and hear like a Mahler symphony um and then you get another feeling when you are on stage and we did Ho Down from Rodeo by Aaron Copeland and I mean, it's rock and roll up there. I mean, you got this full brass section, rah, you got the percussion, the strings just going all at it. But then I went and was like, dude, this is a hoedown and we're in a symphony orchestra and that doesn't feel like much of a hoedown. So I'm gonna play it on the button accordion for a polka band. So this is my little rendition of hoedown. <laughs> it's a classical piece meant to evoke a an old school hoedown and then it's a fiddle tune not an accordion song and 
you have improvisational elements, you know, as I've developed my arrangement of this song for years, you know, it's just like, oh, well, I have these other Im influences, or I've had a fiddle player that came into my band. He's like, okay, let's open up a little bit of a solo section in there. I'm like, oh, okay. And it's like, oh, I can find certain things that really fly well on the accordion. And also through improvisation, um, I'm always using it as a tool to see what I can't do on the instrument. And so if there's a certain lick or a certain style or something like that, or any kind of technique, if I can start incorporating it, incorporating it into improvisation or into composition, it's a way to open up that line of communication, mm -hmm. empathy and whatever. Yeah. I know you're always pushing the envelope. <laughs> it's fun times. <laughs> hey, help everybody know what's coming up. What are you working on projects? So right, right now, obviously, the gig schedule is that we don't know, you know. Um, so that has been allowing me to do a lot of recording. I've been doing some stuff where I'm collaborating with artists from around the world. Um, I started a little project where I, um, I started writing a song. And then Dennis Novato, who is an excellent, probably the greatest but living diatonic button accordion player in the Alpine style, he wrote the second section to the song and then... Wow. We're going to get other artists from Slovenia to write the third section to the song. Then we're recording it. And then musicians from around the world are going to add the playing with it. Um, and so that, that's, it's stuff that I wouldn't have had time to do otherwise. You know, um, there's been a lot of recording going on. Um, I am working. I, I started an album two or three years ago where I got studio time with, random accordion players well not random i mean accordion players i don't get to play with often yeah. um one and getting my band to play with them having to adapt styles so we spent two days in the studio last year in louisiana with Corey ledette who's a grammy nominated the accordion dragon and he's a great zydeco player and and that was a lot of fun where we're jamming out, getting the Zydeco and the blues thing happening, bringing him over to Polka Land a little bit. Danny Jarabic came down to Florida for a few days to escape the harsh winters of, of Wisconsin one time. And we're looking to do collaborative stuff like that. So I'm hoping to be getting some more work done with Josh and Max Baca from San Antonio, like some of the greatest Conjunto players. Mm -hmm. And that's expanding my horizons. So you can be looking for a lot more recording coming out soon. Um, there'll be some live streams. And once we're allowed to get back on the road, um, a renewed um, vigor for performing everything from the chicken dance to Thunderstruck and, and looking forward to um, seeing my fellow musicians and, and audiences. That'll be a great time. <laughs> oh man. I can't wait. <laughs> How can people find you and stay in touch? They can find me, of course, at alexmeitzner.com, A-L-E-X-M as in Mary, E-I-X, N as in Nancy, E-R.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, YouTube, all that kind of stuff. I am not on TikTok. Um, so you're not going to see any crazy Alex dances, at least not yet. Um, um, my kids and my wife have told me that I embarrass myself anytime that I try dancing. So um, I will probably say that I'm not going to develop that talent. Um, so. All right. I won't, I won't be putting any pressure on you then, like you put pressure on me. <laughs> nah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Alex, this has been great. Thank you for taking time out of, of your family life and all the projects you've got going on and the teaching now. Appreciate your being here with us. I want to thank the audience too for coming into Legendary Accordion Festival. We've got great content all of this week, Monday through Friday. Come back and check us out and do me a favor, ask a hundred of your best friends to show up too. We'd really appreciate your support and having you in the audience. Thank you so much. Remember, be well and keep on squeezing. Thanks, Alex. Thank you so much, Terry. Up, one that we all agree Look to the sky, dark clouds on the sea Bad news all around me, not sure